In today's marvelous video, we will be taking a look at one of the most popular shows to come out of the 80s, the A-Team. You know, the ones you call when you have a problem and no one else can help. Finding the band of mercenaries might be a bit more complicated, given the fact that almost four decades separate us from the show's initial release. So it's alright to be a little rusty on the topic as in this video. We will tell you all there is to know about the iconic series. But before we dive in, please like the video and subscribe to our channel. It might be just a small click for you, but to us, it means an awful lot. With that out of the way, it's time to get up your mohawks and light some crude cigars, because here we go. Before we go into our explanation, we have a very small request. If you like our content, please support us by subscribing to our channel. This is a small click for you, but for us, it means a lot. Thank you. Let's begin. The intriguing odyssey of crafting the legendary A-Team In the 1980s, TV was a way of life. The medium was growing like never before, and the decade was golden for sitcoms and big, goofy action adventures. However, in 83, the network giant NBC was struggling with sagging rating, and the executives began searching for their next big success. Among these executives was one Brandon Tartikoff, who was highly influenced by films like The Road Warrior and The Dirty Dozen. When coming up with an idea for his own original series, Tartikoff decided to blend the two together, creating a loose narrative about soldiers of fortune hunted by the government, who take up missions that no one else can accomplish. He approached veteran producer Stephen Cannell, and the two quickly came up with a specific, action-oriented, yet funny tone for the show. Cannell enlisted the help of his writing partner, Frank Lupo, and the vague idea soon gained substance. The two decided that the show would be about a team of unconventional heroes from military background who had served together in a special forces unit in the Vietnam War. After being wrongly convicted of a crime they did not commit, the team would find themselves on the wrong side of the law and turn into mercenaries for hire. Cannell reportedly wrote the script in about 12 to 15 days, and according to him, they made it a point to push boundaries in the stories they were telling. According to the writer, Tartikoff told the writers to break all the rules, which are essentially the rarest words in mainstream TV production. With the story taking shape and the concept almost ready, it was now time to get into the casting. The show revolves around four characters who serve as our protagonists throughout the show. Captain John Hannibal Smith and Lieutenant Templeton Faceman Peck, Captain H.M. Howling Mad Murdoch, and the Sergeant First Class, B.A. Barakis. According to Cannell, Tartikoff had already zeroed in on some actors to star in the show. Most notable among these early castings was that of Mr. T, who played the role of B.A. Barakis. Cannell and Lupo were told to craft the story while keeping in mind Mr. T's unique personality, which had grown in prominence due to his popular roles in films like Rocky. Another early decision was that of casting Dirk Benedict in the role of Templeton Peck. However, the studio insisted that they cast a younger actor instead. Due to this, Tim Dunnigan essayed the role during the series pilot, but the actor himself acknowledged that his appearance was far too youthful for a veteran of the Vietnam War. I mean, the guy was literally in high school when the war ended. The studio came to its senses, and for all the other episodes, Benedict assumed the role of the master con man con man. The most famous actor in the ensemble was George Pappard, who was cast as the leader of the A-Team, Colonel Hannibal Smith. Pippard was a bona fide star who had already worked in acclaimed productions like Breakfast at Tiffany's and How the West Was Won, but by 1982, he was nearing the tail end of his illustrious career. Pippard was attracted to Hannibal as the character was a master of disguise, and this would allow Pippard to play a bunch of diverse characters on the same show. Of course, there was also the money, which Pippard bluntly accepted as something he needed at that point in his career. But the inclusion of Pippard on the cast also led to a much more complicated problem that could have toppled the entire dynamic of the show. As the two biggest stars on the set, both Pippard and Mr. T, had something of an ego. However, the arcs these two artists were on were completely opposite, as Mr. T was just rising to fame while Pippard's star was waning. Due to this, despite being the leader of A-Team, Pippard's character was often overshadowed by Mr. T. As we all know, being upstaged is the one thing that Hollywood stars can't stand at all, and it was kinda obvious that this would lead to conflict between the two of the show's most iconic characters. Things got pretty bad, apparently. At one point, the two actors would not even speak to each other, so they chose to communicate via intermediaries instead. Fortunately, these issues did not spill over into the fictional reality of the A-Team, and for five long seasons, the team remained inseparable. The last core member of the A-Team is Captain H.M. Murdoch, who bears the nickname Howling Mad. With a moniker like that, it's kinda obvious that the character would be anything but sane. 
and this accomplished pilot is certainly too far gone. Murdoch resides in a veteran's mental institution for the first four seasons and has to be broken out for every mission. We think that it's pretty evident from the characters we mentioned that the cast of A-Team was an edgy bunch, especially for the time. Though the show never shied away from violence, with countless explosions and gunfights scattered throughout the show. One interesting exception is that the show never depicted a death on screen, which also allowed it to appeal to a younger demographic. By January 1983, NBC was finally ready with its new show, and it soon premiered on the network. To say that the show was a success would be an understatement. I mean, we wouldn't be here still discussing it in 2024 if it was merely successful. The A-Team was a phenomenon all across America and became one of the few series that garnered appreciation from almost all demographics. Persistently standing amongst the most watched shows in terms of TV rating, the series became a mainstay in American households. For the first three seasons, The A-Team remained one of the most successful shows to come out of the 80s, garnering praise from audiences for its sheer absurdity. But by the time the fourth season rolled out, the part was over. The show was quite a considerable decline in ratings between its third and fourth season, and the show dropped in ranking. After occupying the desirable Tuesday time slot for four years, the show was relocated to a new time slot on Friday, and this proved to be the final nail in its coffin. After seven episodes of the fifth season, it was undeniable that the iconic show had fallen out of favor with the audiences. In November 1986, NBC backed out of producing the final nine episodes of the last season, effectively canceling The A-Team. Despite its short run, the show is still remembered fondly by an entire generation that grew up with a likable mercenary. Though we did get a film based on the series in 2010, it wasn't nearly as successful as it needed to be in order to spawn a franchise. We understand that the last section might have been a downer, especially for longtime fans of the show but shed no tears, as the show has been kept alive on internet forums and chat rooms by fans like you. Now that we have more or less gone through both the conceptualization and the cancellation of the series, let's dive into the stories that made the A-Team so memorable. Exploring the episodes of A-Team A major part of the A-Team's appeal was its goofy, on-the-nose style of storytelling, which made it easily accessible to almost every age group. It's almost cartoon-like sensibilities when depicting violence, where no one is ever seriously hurt, provided the perfect escapist world for the audiences of the time. The episodes of the A-Team are certainly formulaic, but there's a consistency to them that makes the show incredibly entertaining. Audiences always know what they are getting into, and each episode opens with narration. The narrator states that in 1972, a crack commando unit who served in the Vietnam War was falsely convicted of a crime they did not commit. Today, these men survive as soldiers of fortune, and as one might expect by now, they are the A-Team. Strangely, this short exposition dump clearly captures everything you need to know about the show and our protagonists. Still, let's look a little deeper into the origins of the famous mercenary crew. It has been implied throughout the show that the A-Team used Green Beret during the war. The team's former commanding officer, Colonel Morrison, ordered them to rob the Bank of Hanoi to end the war. Obviously, the protagonists succeeded, but when they came back to the base, they discovered that Colonel Morrison had already been killed by the Viet Cong. In addition to this, all documentation regarding their mission had been destroyed when the HQ was burned to the ground. Reduced to robbers, the soldiers are imprisoned at the maximum security facility, Fort Bragg. One thing we know for sure is that our main characters have a way of slipping out of prison, and this feat is especially easy for our decorated veteran for most of the show. The crew indulges in many standalone exploits with very rare overarching plots. Though this might seem repetitive, the show's stunning simplicity is a big part of its success. Despite the high-octane stunts and world-ending stakes, the plotline remains easy to follow, with most situations revolving around international espionage. Along the way, the A-Team has found themselves on missions like overthrowing a dictator, rescuing scientists, and recovering top-secret Star Wars defense information from the Soviets. But we are getting ahead of ourselves. Let's do this right and start from the very beginning of the show. The first episode of A-Team titled Mexican Slay Ride first originated as a feature-length pilot TV movie, but was later split into two installments for syndication. The film starts with a recurring character, Amy Allen, played by Melinda Coolia on the trial of the A-Team. Apparently, the reporter has decided to heed the opening narrator's advice, as she does have a problem no one else can solve. After some digging, the astute reporter uncovers the mercenary group's location and asks for their help in finding a fellow reporter who had been kidnapped by Mexican outlaws. The team consists of Hannibal, Face, and B.A., who are being chased by Colonel Lynch, who comes up with the clever idea of trailing Amy to the group's location. Despite being on the run, the group is able to free their pilot, Howling Mad Murdoch, from the psychiatric hospital and casually scam their way to a Gulfstream jet 
B.A. promptly passes out, exhibiting his trademark fear of flying while their clinically insane pilot whisks them away to Mexico. In Mexico, the team discovers that it is a local marijuana cultivator who orchestrated the kidnapping of Amy's friend, but never the ones to shy away from conflict. Face and HM acquire a crop duster and spray the marijuana fields with ammonia, killing the crops. Next, the team almost drives the gangsters out of their village with the help of an armored bus. However, local guerrillas interrupt the battle. These guerrillas are naturally friends of the gangster and end up catching the A-Team. It seems that all is over for the mercenary group, but fortunately, Face is able to slip by the captor. The charming con man uses his skills to convince the villagers to come to their aid, and the A-Team is eventually able to make their way out of a pretty terrible situation. This episode genuinely captures everything that makes the show so great. The chemistry between the actors is perfect, and they bounce off of each other perfectly. It also has many moments of comedic brilliance especially in the sequence where the intimidating B.A. passes out due to his fear of flying. Also, there's one character that we forgot to mention. It is black with red stripes and turbine magwheel. Of course, we're talking about the team's GMC Vandora van. Since A-Team's initial release, the automobile has become an enduring pop culture icon due to its unique look and rugged feel. The van is strangely distinctive, an odd choice for a group that's in hiding. Throughout the 98 episodes of the series, the van remained a constant companion for our hero, and one of the six original vans used in the production was displayed in the Cars of Stars Motor Museum in Keswick, Northern England. The show proved with its first episode itself that it contained all the four ingredients necessary to create an 80s hit. Catchphrases, cool vehicle, pumped up tunes, and star cameo. The first of these cameos occurs in the second episode itself, titled The Children of Jamestown. This episode documents the A-Team's efforts to rescue a young girl from the clutches of a fanatical cult led by the insane clergyman, Reverend Martin Jane. That reverend is played by veteran actor John Saxon, who had starred in almost 200 films and TV projects by that time. Twisted in all the right ways, Saxon's performance is still a treat to behold. Throughout its run, the show hosted some very recognizable faces, including Hulk Hogan, Isaac Hayes, and Rick Jane. After a brief run-through of the early episodes, it's easy to see a pattern emerge. Most episodes in the show start off with innocent people being hunted by gunmen for some reason or another. The victims would eventually end up contacting the AT. They'd get into the van, find the culprit, fire a lot of guns that don't really hurt anyone, and eventually come up with an outlandish solution to the problem. Also, we'd be amiss if we didn't recognize the cinematic achievement of the AT montage, a narrative device employed by the show at least once in every episode. Over the course of this montage, the A-Team could transform even the most mundane of objects into heavy armament, which often proved essential to win the day. It doesn't really get more 80s than this. The final episode of the first season also showcased a more humane side of the team to the forefront. This episode titled, a nice place to visit, provided the audience with a glimpse at the time the A-Team spent in the Vietnam War. We find our heroes on their way to a small town to pay respects to a recently deceased comrade from Vietnam. After a brief investigation, the team realizes that the small settlement is ruled by four brothers, who also had a hand in their friend's death. In typical fashion, the team would then proceed to avenge their brother. But what's most interesting about this episode is that we are finally given insight into how the events of the war still bear heavily on our seasoned warrior. The first season of the show was a massive success, and NBC quickly greenlit the team's second outing. Emboldened by the success, the show's creative team kept spinning increasingly creative exploits for the mercenary. For instance, take the season two episode, The Only Church in Town, where Face receives a cryptic letter from his college sweetheart and leads the team to Ecuador. As the team still doubts Face's story, he is forced to officially hire his own team, revealing a humorous camaraderie between the individual members of the team. Another strangely personal tale amongst the team's exploits is episode 23 of the second season titled Curtain Call. Much of the runtime here is devoted to the team's memories of Murdoch, who's grievously injured at the moment.